I'm going to turn it over. Um, but thank you very much. And he's going to speak for a few minutes and then open it up for questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Hi. Um, it's good to be here. Um, many of you know me. Um, for those of you who don't, I'll just spend a couple minutes real quickly giving you some background. Um, I have a long history in infrastructure. been working in the Valley since 1990 and uh, was part of the original OpenStack founding in the summer of 2010 and then part of the OpenStack Foundation uh, forming in 2012. Um, I'm responsible for the propagation of the pets versus cattle meme that you've probably used uh, quite a bit. Um, and then another thing that people don't know about me is that in the early days of sort of the cloud bloggers and pundits, there was a very small group of people called the Clouderati. I don't really like that term, but it was a small group of bloggers that um, got together in early summer 2008. And we effectively coined the term cloud computing at that time. Because up until that point, we were all using different terms. We all got together, and we just all started using the phrase cloud computing. So if you go back and you look at like Google Trends, you'll see that like summer 2008, that's when the term cloud computing takes off. So, um, so I feel privileged to have been very early. Um, but in some ways, it's painful um, being one of the early startups in the OpenStack space, because it's now just started to kind of mature. And, um, and I guess that's about it. And hopefully, you will ask me some interesting questions at the end. Um, I like freeform questions. In fact, if I could, I would just stand up here and riff and, and sort of talk without any slides. But sometimes pictures are helpful. So um, let's just get going. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, I've been talking about this for since 2009, when I very first started doing public speaking. One of the very first things I started to assess was that public cloud was really winning. Uh, we were on trajectory for Amazon Web Services to hit something like $15, $16 billion in revenue. I think my prediction was 2015, so I was almost on the money. Um, but what you see is this really sort of VMware's revenue versus Amazon's revenue. And I think um, what happens is, people get confused about where we are. Probably not this group, but um, uh, sort of the legacy IT folks get very confused. They think that you know, there's some kind of you know, battle for you know, private versus public cloud, but that ship has pretty much sailed, right? I mean, you can see the growth trajectory on Amazon. Um, I'd venture to guess there's more VMs under management in Amazon probably than there are across all enterprises, all the Fortune 2000, let's say, at this point. So why? That's the interesting question to ask ourselves, right? Why, why is public cloud winning? And what it really comes down to is that um, it, it's not about I can pay by the drink. It's not about you know, I can get somebody else to sort of manage my mess. It's about I need to go now. I need to go right now. right? If you think about it, historically what's happened is there's sort of been, um, I'm skipping around now. I'm going to come back. There's been this kind of tug of war between the line of business and the infrastructure IT teams, right? You get the people, the developers in the line of business, and they're tasked by the enterprise to go and deliver some new service or capability or feature or whatever it is, and to do it as quickly as possible, right? Because their job is to drive new revenue streams for the, for the company, for the business, right? But when they go to the centralized IT teams, they say, hey, I need this much, right? And the centralized IT teams look at that list of requirements and they say, oh, we can do that. It'll take 18 months and you know, $10 million, right? Is that in your budget? And up until the advent of something like Amazon Web Services, you know, there was no real way to resolve this. What happened is you know, the line of business sat around twiddling their thumbs. But now if they do that, another business comes out of nowhere, an Airbnb, a Lyft, you know, somebody like that and starts to clobber their actual business, right? They start to rethink and, and they move at a rate that the, that, the, uh, that the enterprise can't sustain. And so we've had this tug of war between line of business and enterprise IT because enterprise IT is incentivized to manage down risk and line of business is incentivized to basically create new opportunities, right? And so that's really why public cloud has taken off. And that's also why you see people within the enterprise really looking at DevOps as a way to break down um, those silos. So, um, oops, let's go here. I'll go through my build. Apologize. So this is something I've been working on. Um, it's, I don't think it's up on the blog yet, um, but I'm hoping to, to kind of get to it this next year. When I think about that, when I sort of say to myself, 
what is it that line of business cares about? It's the time to value, right? How can I deliver a new service, new capability quickly? And then what you see is you see people sort of hubbing around five things to drive moving fast, right? First is they want on-demand services, whether it's inside the business or outside, whether it's hybrid, public, private, none of these things matter, but they want something on-demand. They want an API they can call to basically get things now. Right? That's what allows them to not worry so much about what they're trying to deliver or when they can deliver it because developers understand APIs. Right? The second thing that they want is they want platform independence, whether it's open source tools or whether it's you know, open APIs or whatever it is or standards, they're saying, hey, you know, I need to make sure that wherever I am, you know, I'm not locked in and I've got the ability to move. The third, fourth, and fifth are really tied together, which is they're moving towards this DevOps model Right? And they're looking at that as a way to affect culture change, but they're also looking at it as a way to actually tighten the feedback loop. Right? So one of the most important things is that if you deliver fast, you also want to measure how your customers felt about what you delivered and then iterate again. Because right? that, that's the value of that, sort of, of that uh, fast delivery model. So <clears throat> in the past, we've had this very, very simple way of looking at cloud where we had infrastructure as a service, we had platform as a service, and we had software as a service. And what I'm sort of proposing is that actually there's this big, thick layer that's in between platform as a service and infrastructure as a service that we've sort of ignored, but that actually most of the investment of somebody like Amazon Web Services has gone into. So traditionally, the definition, my definitions, right? Maybe not everybody agrees with this, but my definitions are here. Yeah, I'll let you read it yourself. The most important one to me uh, to talk about is PaaS, because a lot of times when I start talking about services as a platform, people say, well, isn't that just platform as a service? Actually, when I think of platform as a service, I think of Cloud Foundry, I think of OpenShift, I think of a system that is basically uh, you know, on, on training wheels, right? You say to the developer, you know, point, your, uh, you know, uh, point this system, Cloud Foundry, at your source code repository, and check out a specific commit, and basically deploy that code and run it. Right, inside of a very constrained environment. That's what I think of as platform as a service. And I think that's the, the standard definition for most people as well. Um, but services as a platform is something a little bit different. I'll let you read that. It's sort of more this notion that almost every, almost every important new application or service that you're going to develop actually has particular needs. OK, I get it, right? you're running Sugar CRM or a Drupal website that doesn't have special needs. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Netflix going on to Amazon Web Services and putting their core mission critical you know, software and capabilities there. That's all net new you know, competitive differentiation you know, code, right? And so when they started that process, they used a bunch of what Amazon had, but they also realized that they needed to build a bunch of their own underlying uh, uh, services. And that's where we got the Netflix OSS suite, right? And what that all is, is essentially a custom platform as a service. So services as a platform is this notion that the inherent value, the biggest value of a public or private cloud system is that it delivers a whole set of different services. Say there's 100, but the apps that you're going to put on top of that layer cake maybe use 20% of that 100 different services. But they all use a different 20%. Maybe they don't all need messaging as a service. Maybe they don't all need notifications as a service and so on. Um, but they need some subset, right? And that's the way you get leverage. So this kind of lays it out, right? If we talk about pass, it's very focused on developers. Load your code and go system. If we talk about services as a platform, it's developers and operators. It's the DevOps uh, folks, right? You've got a constrained model versus a microservices composable model. And you've got sort of like the pre-fee menu versus the a la carte menu, right? A fixed menu versus a menu where you get to pick the pieces that you want. OK. So this is my like, aha, gotcha slide, OK? This, this, at the time of the last time that I updated this deck, was the set of AWS services that um, probably now if I went and I updated this, there'd be many more. But one of the things you'll notice that's very striking is that just looking at services, not consumption, but services, you know, we have a fairly big investment by Amazon in infrastructure as a service, a little bit in platform as a service and software as a service, but the vast bulk, the vast bulk of what they deliver are point solutions. They're things that are not a platform, 
and they are not a piece of software. They are a specific service that does something. You know, data pipelining, functions, MapReduce, you know, relational database services, voice recognition. None of these things are useful by, them, by themselves. They're only useful if they're composed together to support another application that's trying to do something. And so if you're in the line of business and you're like, oh, I can go to Amazon now. I don't have to go to the centralized IT guys. You're thrilled because whatever you're trying to accomplish, you can get 70 or 80% of it done using all this stuff very, very quickly. And that's the value. And this is where Amazon continues to invest. If you look at all the net new stuff, it keeps going in this blue area, right? It's neither infrastructure as a service nor platform as a service. It's in this gray area in between. And that's part of why I wanted to talk about this is because I think it's really interesting that this gray area is so big. It's so big and they're doing so much here and so much of it is sticky. James Kelly, my uh, colleague, has informed me that SAP is sticky. And I said, yes, that's true, James. Thank you for that. <laughs> OK, so um, Dev OK, Robert, raise your hand. You're respons he's responsible for the, uh, for the reference to Jeremy Clarkson and, and Top Gear. But you get the point, right? The thing about DevOps is that um, it, or the thing about uh, services as a platform is that it's really the ideal tool for DevOps, right? People talk about DevOps a lot. They talk about, you know, sort of how it's breaking down sort of the, bar the silos between the developers and operators. And, you know, in some ways they talk about it as being sort of taking the agile software development methodologies and moving those into the operational uh, world of things. Um, but the reality is, is that if you go off and you have every DevOps team build their own silo, where they build their own messaging service and their own queuing service and their own notification service, and they each do that, you're still back in the old way of doing things, right? You sort of can't separate services as a platform and DevOps, right? You've got to have this architectural notion inside of your business if you're building a private cloud or you're consuming a public cloud where you're using the, a similar set or the same set of overall you know, services and composing them into custom passes for each new application that's coming out, you don't want people to go out and start building silos because then you don't get any operational leverage. So if you were to take my, my crazy eye chart and you were sort of, you can almost divide it in half. There's the pieces that are services as a platform and then there's the pieces that are DevOps. You can see how that comes together. And yes, I, I definitely need a better slide than this to explain it. But, so how does this relate to OpenStack? And to a certain degree to Kubernetes. But this is OpenStack Meetup, so we'll talk about OpenStack. Well, I sort of said, hey, if I go and I look at all the capabilities that Amazon Web Services provides, is there an equivalent? You know, is there an open source equivalent of those capabilities? And it turns out everything in red is here. And obviously, I haven't updated this because you've got TensorFlow now. And you've got some other things that I, you know, clearly would be in red as well. And if we were talking about something like Kubernetes, there's clearly components for a service catalog too. Um, but the point here is that there isn't really any reason you can't deliver services as a platform inside your business using a private cloud, using something like OpenStack. It's just that you have to have the mentality that each develop and DevOps team isn't re-implementing and rebuilding the wheel. You've got to have the mentality that you're actually building this thick middle layer. This is where the value is. Because if you deliver VMs on demand to your developers, they're like, meh, not, not very interesting. right? Whereas if you deliver a suite of services they can, they can use, and maybe perhaps services that are specific to your business, like credit card processing, so on, then that's high, high value. So I went through this pretty quick, because I actually want you guys to give me a bunch of hard questions. Um, and I just want to wrap up. So speed is life, right? This is the new norm. If businesses don't move fast, if they don't have sort of a, a, a more agile manner in which they deliver new services, you know, they're going to get crushed. Second is that the way to get that speed is not just DevOps, and it's not just services as a platform. It's the combination of the two. The third is that the bulk of the, of the work in cloud is in that services of platform. When people come out and they say, oh, I've delivered VMs on demand or I've delivered containers on demand, that's actually not the bulk of the work. So I always get a little frustrated, especially in OpenStack land, when people want to treat OpenStack like, um, you know, sort of like a science project. Because what you really need is you just need whatever version of OpenStack or VMware or whatever it is up as a foundational component, and then you need to get going using the uh, building services on top of that. 
And then this last, which I didn't have a chance to talk about in this uh, deck today, is that I think if you look at some of the new models for delivering services, like the Kubernetes model, that's a full application and service software development lifecycle, right? So it includes how you do upgrades, it includes how you put things in and out of service, and so on. And so that is you know, where we want to go if we want services as a platform to be something that's easy to roll out, and we want any given enterprise to be able to um, take it, uh, you know, actually build a private cloud effectively. All right. So I didn't introduce Robert Starmer. A lot of you guys know him. He's he's hosted this meetup before, uh, presented at this meetup. Um, he was at Cisco many years ago, so knows a lot about networking and um, knows a lot about a lot of things because he's the founder and CTO of Cumulus Technologies, and he's out there every day implementing. OpenStack, he's a certified OpenStack admin, COA, which is not easy to do. And if you want to get that, he can help you get that certification. He teaches that as well. He's done hands-on classes on Kubernetes for this group before. So very knowledgeable. You can also ask him questions. And now he has a mic. Um, and OK, so we will let you guys take it from there, and we'll figure out the, the questions from the feed. OK, I think Rick has a question to begin. Hi, Randy. Um, <laughs> Real good stuff. Um, I just need a little clarification. Is, is there or what is the difference between uh, service as a platform and API as a service? That's a great question. Uh, what's the difference between uh, web services using SOAP and REST web, web REST-based web services? I did. I'm a bad man. That's not allowed. Um, Why not? I, I mean, I, I, think, I, think there's, I think the major difference is that the, the historical manner in which you would, people approach this in the enterprise, and, and you see this a lot right now, is that they say, oh, you know, we need to access this application that runs on the mainframe that's using these very old technologies and interfaces, so we'll fix this by like, taking something in like Apogee and slapping a REST interface on top of the mainframe. And that is a way to put a service into, into the rotation, um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect or deal with sort of the needs that cloud native applications have, right? And one of the, some of the needs that they have are they need to be designed for scale out. They need to implement things like service meshes or something like service message meshes that have things like the circuit breaker pattern in them, and they need to be designed for failure. Um, and so a lot of that stuff's missing when you just slap a REST API on a you know, legacy service. When I'm talking about services as a platform, I'm talking about all of the services that you consume from your cloud native app are also themselves cloud native <laughs> services. Like I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that putting like an Oracle rack cluster and making it multi-tenant and, and on, on top of your you know, OpenStack system and having all of your developers use it winds up giving you an Oracle rack service. Like, I, like I, OK, it does, but it doesn't, right? It's not got the same inherent value as having you know, cloud native you know, all the way down. But Does doesn't, that help? doesn't, I mean, it's kind of an interesting space because if you start applying, uh, applying RESTful APIs on top of a service, like saying, OK, I've got this old mainframe, it has a certain scale. We know that that's going to be a limitation. But by putting a REST API, I put HTTP in front. Uh, sorry, I put HTTP in front of it. Uh, now I have a way of potentially scaling that, caching those concepts. You know, starting to drive microservices can leverage that resource and maybe give me that scale. Is it a way of enabling that service integration? Maybe. I, I mean, service-oriented architectures have been around for a long time. You know, and if through one lens, this is nothing different. Um, but again. You know, I think mainframe might not have been the best example there because you know mainframes have a fair bit of like you know scale. Um, but if we look at a lot of other kinds of services that you might have inside the business, you know, I remember one financial services business I knew was processing transactions with Perl running on top of Windows, you know, in a batch mode. That's not you can't like okay maybe you can put a REST API in front of that, but that's not like a cloud native service. And so I do think that inherent. Thing that didn't come out here, so thanks. This, that's a great question. I can, like, as I talk about this more, I can, I can add that into the equation. But is that you know anything inside a services as a platform system is cloud native, all the way down. Okay, so so to make it service as a platform, cloud native infrastructure is effectively a requirement, right? Well, it's not infrastructure, right? It's not the infrastructure. It's that layer right above the infrastructure. Yeah, I'm just saying that that in order for it to to be a service part of the platform, yeah. Right? You really need to, it needs to act in a cloud enabled way. 
That's right. Cloud native way. Okay. That's good. So questions. Hey, Randy. How's it going? Good. How are you, man? Long time no see. It's been a while. Hey, um, I think that Lambda is going to be Cloud 2.0. I think that you know that's going to become the preeminent model, not the only model in the future. So how does all of this play in a world of Lambda, which abstracts away a lot of things that uh, cloud users have to deal with now? Like with Lambda, you don't need to mess with containers. Uh, you know, VMs are actually suboptimal for Lambda. And yes, they do need things like persistent storage and, and speech recognition and, and uh, ML, et cetera, but those can just be folded into the event stream, right? They're just giant Lambdas. So I mean, what do you think is going to happen? I see Lambda as an inflection point. Do you see that? And do you think that's going to be a big thing, or is it just another service in the portfolio? I think it's another service, an important service. But let, let's admit it, right? If that, if that architectural model was, had, was going to win, Lisp would you know, be dominant at this point, right? Well, and, but and, Lisp is a language. I mean, I, I love Lisp, but it's a freaky syntax, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's also the way that Lisp is inherently distributed, and you're passing around you know, the same data as the code. Um, it's just a very different way of thinking about your architectural paradigm. I think lambdas are going to take off on event processing, any kind of like data type pipelines. It just, it, I think it'll be very easy for people to grok. I'm actually working on kind of a, my own idea around some lambda stuff. Can't really talk about it, but you know, I went and I talked to some people who know a lot more than I do and are kind of in the midst of it, doing some startups on it. And you know, universally, it was like the biggest impediment here is like developers understanding this model. And I just I think that that's going to continue to be a challenge. So I think it's an important piece. I think, but I don't think it's something that winds up being the new the new new for everything. I just I don't think some stuff won't work like in that model. With with the with the lambda related tools, I mean, a lot of the folks that I see using it very effectively are that the the web interface layer, potentially the front end or the the resources that are sitting right towards the very front end of the end user experience. Right, because they're the ones that are, are receiving a, uh, an event request and actually being able to process it. Is that maybe the, the area that you're talking about? It's, it's not so much necessarily some of the other back-end services that, that Lambda addresses. Um, actually, I'd al also like to hear you talk about the container uh, conversation uh, relative to Lambda, because last I checked, uh, most Lambdas run in containers. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is on the back end, it, they, people want to use it as a lightweight batch processing system. Right? We've had batch processing for a long, a long time, but you know, it's a lot easier to just like cast out you know, a bunch of uh, Lambda functions and run them in parallel. On the front end, you know, what I think is interesting is that sometimes you don't know how the system is going to be used. So there's parts of the system that you can have like respond to really spiky requests by having that farmed out to Lambda because right, then you can run a whole bunch of stuff in parallel. And I think that is of high value. Because I remember when we first started this journey, people would talk about VM spin-up times. And we're like, Amazon, five minutes, yeah. Right? And now that seems really kind of slow. And a lot of people are looking at, OK, containers now, you know, five, you know, five second, 15 second spin-up times. And I think Lambda is sort of the next evolution of that, which is like, can I get even lower latency for certain kinds of activities, especially on the front end where it matters, and um, where I can actually do a lot of processing very, very quickly for things that I know are going to occur. Yeah, I mean, I see people talking about Lambda in the microsecond range, but then they're also worried about uh, about the startup cost of a function, whether it's a you know cold start, which is container plus function, or just that function being able to restart, maybe it crashes and yeah. you know all the pooling that are related to it too. So yeah, yeah. Okay. did that good or <laughs> okay? Um, He's questions? stirring the pot. Okay, <laughs> that's an important one. All right, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> yeah, simple question. Um, is uh, SAP the new middleware? Is SAP the new middleware? Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I mean, again, I think it's really important to look at this as uh, a custom platform as a service, um, and the reason is. So again, there was a reason I made a distinction between sort of like the run-of-the-mill applications that an enterprise has, the stuff that does, you know, billing or CRM or whatever, right? Everybody's got all these kind of utility apps sitting around. That's there's no value for SAP for that, right? I mean, go get a software as a service solution, you know, go use Can, you know, software that runs on Drupal or whatever the hell it is. But when it comes to the applications and services that are specific to your business, they're specific to your business model, whether you're booking hotels or you're doing financial transactions or whatever that is, you have secret sauce in there, right? So one of the major values of services as a platform is that you get, basically get to have secret sauce that you build as a service that's in that portfolio of services that you can, that you can reuse, 
right? Right now, if you look at the way that it works, you've got, uh, uh, say, a, a credit card uh, processing system inside of financial services, you know, a credit card company, right? And that credit card system, everybody builds basically an individual integration point to. Whereas services as a platform says, you take that, you refactor it into a cloud native app, you run it on a single platform, and it's one of many services that then you can compose into. And a bunch of your mission critical competitive differentiation applications that are now cloud native may call some, some or all of those. Right? So I think that um, that makes sense. I'm not sure that was. Well, may maybe another way of thinking about it. So the middleware question, right, uh, comes up because people start saying, well, you know, you, you, you have OpenStack as middleware. Why? Because it's in the middle of the developer and the infrastructure, right? And then you have I think we Kubernetes. would consider middleware like a, the Java suite or something like that. Wouldn't you consider that? So, well, if I was answering your question, I could probably say yes and no. And it does depend yes. on how you define middleware. <laughs> Right, and, and I think that's maybe that's exactly the point, is that SAP could be seen as middleware to an application developer who doesn't want to think about anything below those services. Okay, I see. So right? so what I so the distinction I see is that I it would for me it would be a custom middleware. Right? If I think about most middleware products, they're an attempt to make a very generic middleware platform for the developer to consume basically a bunch of things, whether it's you know, a bunch of Java libraries that all run inside of WebLogic or WebSphere or whatever. Um, whereas where I think of services as a platform is you're building a layer cake of these services, just like a Google has a layer cake, right? There's Google FS and then we have MapReduce and, you know, it just kind of is all stacked up on top of each other, right? Um, but for any given application, it may not use all layers of the layer cake. So would it be more interesting to say it's something along the lines of, Utilities in Linux, Unix, such as SED, awk. I like the way you're thinking, Rocky. <laughs> so there are lots of utilities in, in Linux and Unix that helped a lot of applications become real. And it seems like these are very similar. Right. Each one is a generic, you know, kind of point service that does one thing well. It's designed to scale out. Right? You've got a clean interface to it. You don't worry about how it scales, but you do have some basic rules that are new cloud native rules about when you know it's out of service or you know how to talk to different versions of the API and so on. Um, and then you just use the ones that you need. And then the great thing is, is if you built an application and you're like, oh, crap, now we need to add this new feature, and you suddenly realize it, Turns out that service is already up in and as one of the components in your in your cloud, and you're like, just oh, drop it, drop it into the pipeline. Just like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Everybody uses Grep, not everybody uses Zoc. That's right. Uh, actually, there was a question here first. So one of my uh, concerns about the future of OpenStack is, um, you know, like you say, Only providing one? VMs as a service is. Uh, you know, uh, not a big deal, right? Uh, and I see the future of this going towards, you know, containers and Lambda and things on bare metal and just cut out the middleman, be really super efficient. Uh, yeah. But, you know, OpenStack is also branching out into, I guess, you know, services as a platform, DNS, database, you know, uh, load balancing, et cetera. So do you, do you see this um, evolution uh, going from, you know, these skinny things like containers and platforms just right on bare metal. So, you know, Kubernetes is going to rule the world and OpenStack is going to have to switch, you know, where it provides its value. Yeah. In fact, while I was on the board, which is a long time ago now, almost two years, I spent uh, many, many sessions trying to explain that I thought the inherent, one of the inherent challenges that the OpenStack community and set of projects have was that it was too monolithic and that there wasn't any way to consume one service without all the others. Oh, if you use OpenStack, you must use Keystone. What if I don't need or don't want Keystone, right? And you can go on and on and on. Um, but you know, I lobbied very hard for more an Apache software foundation type model where you know, we could have competitive projects and then you know, they could see, succeed or fail on their own and OpenStack would be more of sort of like an umbrella. And in fact, you do see them starting to reposition now into the Open Infrastructure Foundation and you know, Kata Containers is the first kind of project that has its own uh, technical committee and it's like not really attached to the Borg. And so I think that's very promising. Is it too little too late? Um, you know, is it enough? I don't know, but the, the intention and the direction is right. Um, 
you know, but, you know, I, I identified that for the board over two years ago because it was very clear that, you know, things are still early. There's still a lot of movement. We don't know what's going to win. So it's for the long term, it's better to have a structure that allows success and failure rather than trying to prop everybody up to the same success. So, so do you think that, that OpenStack in the long term is dead? I mean, that's, that's kind of a loaded question, is right? The, is this really an Ask Me Anything <laughs> session? <laughs> I, I mean, I think the OpenStack Foundation has legs, and I think that you know the new direction is is really good for its future. Um, you know, the 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 sort of like foundational OpenStack stuff it does seem has a lot of challenges going forward. I mean, a lot of people have have been less than thrilled with how it's worked for them. Well, I guess that maybe the question is not so much OpenStack per se, because that technology can morph and change over time. Yeah, but the technology around managing VMs, so that the that, that that infrastructure management layer, is that still an important piece? I mean, does anybody the, really want to deal with VMs? So raise your hand if you want to deal with VMs. Not there's not there's not one taker. What do you mean by deal with? I mean, it's kind of you have to, right? No, you don't. They're they're an abstraction layer. You know, here's here's a, here's a, here's a thought exercise for you. Don't tell VMware I said this. Um, Go back and look at the advent of uh, multi-core systems, specifically 64-bit Optimons, when you would have a box that would have four cores and over four gigs of RAM, and you'd be running like DNS on it. Go back and look at that, roughly when that happened, and then look at where VMware takes off. And my, my working theory is that VMware takes off roughly at the time that we move to multi-core 64-bit systems and have a lot of RAM, and a single x86 box has way more processing power and RAM and storage than most single applications can use. At that point, there's an inflection and VMware takes off. But we're not in that model now. We're in this model where applications are decomposed. You can run them all over the place. You can put them in containers. You can have you know, thousands of replicas in different places and only run the ones that matter. And so like, you've moved away from this model where one app is tied to you know, one physical box, and it's much more scale out. And so at that point, does, I don't know. It doesn't look to me like the VM adds much value. Right? Containers have a lot of value because they're built into the way that developers you know, have their build release pipelines. And so they're very friendly. They're more like a packaging exercise rather than uh, uh, compute virtualization. Quick, um, regarding the VMware comment, right? So how do you think people- Are you from VMware? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so um, VMware now can run on AWS. So what do you think about this? Is this Consider a software platform you mentioned, and also <laughs> some comment about OpenShift as well. I don't think VMware runs on AWS. A AWS and, and VMware did a deal where some subset of AWS capacity is running VMware itself. So it's running on top of AWS metal, but not exactly. on top of AWS virtualization technology. Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, so I mean, uh, look, you're Amazon, you're in a position, Amazon Web Services, where you've got 40, 50% year over year growth and you're at you know, 12 plus billion dollars. Uh, it would help if you could open up as many markets as possible. And one of them is clearly lift and shift of, of legacy enterprise apps. So I was talking to a big uh, medical company that's on the West Coast, who I shouldn't name, and they, this is while I was at DMC, and they were extolling the virtues of the V block. And I said, oh, we love the V block. It's 30% cheaper than it takes us to put a rack together. And my, my jaw just dropped. I was like, how, how do you, what are you doing? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, it's 30% cheaper to buy a V block than to put that stuff, those components together for yourself in a rack. And it's just that some IT teams are so dysfunctional that you know, there's a huge amount of value in basically taking the responsibility off of their shoulders and obviating them as teams and lifting and shifting those workloads to Amazon Web Services. But that's very different than where you see all that growth. The vast majority of Amazon's growth is not like taking SAP and, and moving it from inside the enterprise out. The vast majority is in these cloud native applications. It's net new capabilities. In the same way that you know, when we had the first revolution in the 80s, you know, the you know, away from mainframes, you know, the the value was in having a much more distributed model than the mainframe model. There's a bunch. Well, it's awesome. Okay, we should do this more often. I'll go. Um, so we're on the topic of VMs dying. Um, 
<laughs> is Java going to be a casualty? And if so, when? Is Java going to be a casualty? In the Java VM? Isn't it, isn't it already a casualty? <laughs> Um, I mean, you, you know, one of the funny things about talking about technologies dying and, and, you know, when I first was working on the cloud stuff and I'd go out and I'd tell people, like, the old way was dead and, and they got very confused because what I mean by that is that the new dominant paradigm is something else, not that the old thing goes away, right? Because if we look at mainframes, they're still there. <laughs> yeah, I think IBM just announced that they made more money on mainframes last yeah. quarter than anything else. Yeah, so I think, so I, but if you looked at the overall size of the mainframe market, it's relatively small. Right? And if we look at the enterprise computing market, which is 40 to 100 times bigger than the mainframe computing market, uh, then we could maybe extrapolate that the cloud computing market is going to be another 40 to 100 times bigger. And a lot of that's driven by all net new stuff. Um, and so uh, I don't think anything's dead. The Java, Java will probably be around for a long time as a language. But I, 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 we went and we surveyed the kids coming out of college who are going into Y Combinator and said, what are you programming in? I don't think it's Java. Or Go. Go is the new hotness. Or Rust. I'm sorry. Rust, yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, the question is, what is what two, two parts. Can you do what OpenStack can do now with a service mesh, like Envoy? And what you're talking about right now in terms of SAP, it's the same thing as a service mesh? No, so those are really different things. Envoy and OpenStack are not really equivalents. Um, I think getting into a long discussion about Envoy doesn't make sense here. In some ways, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but it's a really different thing. One way to think about Envoy is I was trying to understand it and why people would want it, is when I went out and I talked to people you know, at eBay and a bunch of other places, and I said, okay, what, why, why are you doing this? It's like, well, you know, rather than having you know, a load balancer and then a DNS service and a registry, and like we actually have 10% of each of those things, specifically built for distributed microservices based application. So we basically get a vertical slice of all the, all the pieces we need and, and don't have any of the other components. So that might be the best way to think of Envoy. Um, for that web, for a web-based application that's microservices architecture, Envoy just gives you 10% of each of those capabilities that you actually need and no more. So you wind up getting something lightweight rather than having to deploy a whole bunch of different pieces of software and manage them all independently, right? HA proxy layer, HA proxy layer, HA proxy layer, and then you know your stuff for DNS, your stuff for service registries, and so on. Uh, so that's one of the ways I think about it. And so that's definitely not service as a platform because it's really at the data plane. It's the connective tissue between your microservices components. How do I do, James? Well, I, I, there's, there's also tools like, uh, I mean, Envoy is used by a lot of tools that build larger service meshes, so Istio and tools of that nature. Right? So now you're looking at a services component, a part of your services as a platform and space to provide that connectivity, to provide that, that, that discovery resource, uh, inner app or inner service security, um, you yeah. know, tracing. It's like all these different services that you need in order, especially when you start looking at all the different teams that want to tie their services together, right? When they are building their yeah. additional service piece in the services of platform space, yeah. right? having, having a, a, a consistent way of, of doing that communication it, it, it's, it's an important aspect, right? Um, Absolutely. I mean, that's why I, maybe I should have left the Kubernetes slides in here, but I do think Kubernetes with Helm charts, with things like Envoy and Istio kind of plugged in, help you know give you all the rest of the pieces, the connective tissue to actually be able to deliver these services in a repeatable way that are the same from service to service to service. Um, and I think that's very high value. And in fact, I don't know about you guys, but I get really excited about that stuff because I remember that you know how many different companies I've been at where we reinvented the wheel on this shit inside the business. And then you know you go on and, and you realize that was all just very proprietary. And now we're kind of doing it all out in the open saying, you know, all the we all have these same problems. I mean, we we're just talking to a Google person over dinner and you know they're starting to use Envoy inside of Google and it came out of Lyft. I, like that's just amazing to me. That's just really, really amazing to me. Hey Randy. And you have to put a dollar into the, the Christmas fund for the language there, Randy. We talked about it. Did I drop an F bomb? No, but you dropped an S bomb. Question over here. What do you guys think about virtual appliances like a firewall from one vendor and a load balancer from another that are on different kernel versions? Do they stay VMs or is there a way out of that box? Say it again. Istio. 
So, I mean, are you talking about are you talking about virtualized hardware components? Yeah. Appliances? So the, the, I mean, in the NFV not... world, where you buy VNS from different vendors and that they all are on different kernels, do they stay VMs or do they? No way. So what do you do with them? I mean, you know, you're going to have these legacy environments where people are going to want their VMs and their virtualized hardware appliances. I just, I, it seems very clear that the world's moving forward very quickly. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of time before you have layer seven DPI that's that's distributed, for example. And I just, I don't, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of value in, like, I see people who virtualize a hardware appliance, I'm not going to talk about which company. Um, and then they see that as being software. It's, it's just, I mean, it is software, but it, it's really a virtualized hardware appliance. And, you know, virtualized hardware appliances, you know, they're just not really designed for scale out and they take a whole bunch of extra management and you don't get the opportunity to use the 10% slice that you need. You're all in on 100% of whatever's there. Um, usually the HA models are sort of the legacy HA model of sort of an active active or active passive type approach, which basically says, I'm gonna pretend that this box is one box and then people do crazy things like require like multicast and you know all kinds of crap for the clustering or whatever and and or vips or vrp and all that complexity like nobody wants that anymore right especially the the developers they want to know they there's a load balancing service they can plug into so if you give them the choice of like running a couple of virtual hardware appliances or integrating envoy into their distributed kubernetes app I'm, i can tell you what's going to happen well, and, and in addition, you, you have the same VM problem, right? It's still a virtual machine. It has an operating system. It has all the complexities of that operating system, all the security issues of that operating it, system. It, it, <laughs> right. on, yeah, on and on and on, yeah. Right. So I, I think that's, uh, I think. Right Actually, we, we, the gentleman in the back has been waiting for quite a while. Oh. And uh, before you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fine well, gentlemen uh, as well, I'm so. going to interrupt this program for a super important announcement. There's two beers left. So just saying, two beers. So and as dope. much Coors Light as you want. <laughs> Beer. Oh, those are beer too. Sorry. <laughs> there's two Lagunitas IPAs left. Don't knock me over on the there, way there, to them. There's two real beers left. Uh, it, oh, no. Oh, no. It's, did you just diss Heineken? It's degrees of real. Um, anyway, okay, uh, you guys can decide who, but don't forget our friend in the back. Thanks, Lisa. Mine is pretty straightforward. I'm just curious about, on the SAP, for SAP, what are the security concerns that you see today, maybe going forward, and... How, do, how can they be solved? Oh, cool. Thank you for this question. I actually want to spend a lot more time talking about cloud security in 2018. Um, the biggest problem with security generally in the cloud space is that the legacy security models about building you know, moats and drawbridges, very fixed you know, fortifications and, you know, right? It's defense in depth, but it's, it's defense in depth in static. And so nothing moves and nothing responds to what are becoming highly dynamic environments. And so you see a lot of people starting to work like uh, in, our con in our Contrail security product and Open Contrail, we now have an intent-driven policy where you have a more generic policy that describes how, how uh, access occurs between different layers of a microservices-based architecture, um, but then you actually, that floats around with it. So as the app expands or shrinks or moves from one location to another or bridges across locations, you know, the policy follows it. And so we need to see a lot more implementations of security models, security practices, that are actually more dynamic in nature. And that, that's an inherent challenge. And so you see people trying to solve it. Some in Istio, there's a company I just became an advisor for called Wallarm, W-A-L-L-A-R-M. And Wallarm has got a, a, a web application firewall that uses machine learning to basically profile your application and learn how it behaves and then shut everything else off, right? So that's a really nice way of sort of thinking about the security problem, which is like, how do I have security be more dynamic? Because I think in the past, it's all about the, you know, just putting those uh, walls up and then putting guards on top of the walls and then pretending that that's going to work. And, and uh, you know, not just security, but how about the monitoring space? I mean, I think we have a similar set of problems. Absolutely. That potentially even tie into the security space. Right? Absolutely. Operations needs to be as dynamic as security. In fact, I would say those two disciplines are actually very similar in, in what they're trying to accomplish. You mentioned during your talk, uh, you differentiated between having a bunch of services and then services as a platform. And we haven't really covered how you look at what a platform is. What's the difference between just a bunch of services or services as a platform? Yeah, it should almost be called services as a way to build your own platform. 
except that's a very long acronym, but that's what I would call it if I, if I could. Again, you know, it's really about being able to build a custom pass for each of your, uh, for each of your projects. And when most people start to get it is when I refer again back to Netflix and the fact that they used a set of Amazon Web Services services for underlaying a lot of their new applications, but then they built the pieces that Amazon didn't have, and that became the Netflix OSS suite. And they built essentially a layer cake of similar interrelated services that they could in, then run each of their things on. So it still seems like we're missing something, right? What makes it a platform? In, in Unix, we have a bunch of utilities that, that, that was mentioned, right? Plan 9 was great because everything was just file, right? Plan 9 reference, you should get like a, you should get like, <laughs> I have to do a beer bong hit for that. But there's a little bit of glue that we still need with a bunch of services that makes it a platform, right? So right. So again, that's the piece I sort of left out here, and that I, where I think Kubernetes plus Helm plus Envoy plus Istio is starting to have all the pieces that you would use to build it. But people, you know, I don't pay too much. I, I don't spend too much time on that because um, you know that that needs to happen. I think most people do. If I say you need to build a custom PaaS, you know it's not just about having a messaging service and a DNS service and so on. You know you're going to have to do a little bit more than that because um, Amazon's doing that stuff to, for you, right? They're putting together the billing systems and the authentication systems and all that. But um, you know, I don't go too far into that here, although maybe I should, just because uh, I sort of think it's a given. And what I'm more interested in, at least now, at the early part of the conversation, is just getting people to understand that the value in their cloud system, whether it's public or private, isn't really in this VMs or containers. It's really in the higher order services that their uh, developers can consume. If you want to be competitive building a private cloud inside your business to Amazon, you have to have that same mentality of what you're building. Otherwise, you're just building sort of like, you know, a set of very low level tools that none of the developers want to consume, right? Because at the end of the day, they want speed. Do you think there's a? Do you think there's still an op opportunity then for the folks like OpenShift that, that I mean, you know, they, they kind of migrated from a static pass to effectively a Kubernetes overlay in a sense. Well, why are they doing that, Robert? Yeah. <laughs> well, but, but my point why is, is Cloud that, Foundry doing that? Yeah. So so that's just it, right? So these guys, I think, are starting to realize that there is still an interest in at least some of the development community to say, well, give me that simplified model, but I need all these extra little pieces that you seem to initially. Right. They're use. driving back down from the pass layer into the right. services of the platform layer as people like Amazon are driving up. Right, right, okay, yeah, so. I, I think because at the end of the day, right, if you, you know, I used to have this great chart when I was selling cloud scaling. Um, if you kind of go into an enterprise and you and you look at the set of applications they have, you can sort of triage them. There's the shit that will, oh, the, is that the S-bomb? <laughs> There's the stuff <laughs> that will never migrate to the cloud on the mainframe, or maybe it's your SAP cluster running on Oracle Rack with EMC storage. Hey, I don't work there anymore, it's OK. Um, or it's you know the stuff that was born in the cloud that's 100% cloud native. Or there's this big middle section, you know, kind of like the, the, um, the, the vast gray area of, of, of applications that could be refactored or could be replaced by SaaS or something like that. And so you go through this process of triaging it, and you're like, OK, do we need to do CRM ourselves? Let's just put that on Salesforce. Like, let's stop it. Right? But then you get to a, a set of applications. It's like, oh, this is doing uh, you know, advanced payment services for uh, homeowners who want to do accelerated mortgages. And this one service is sitting here, and it's generating a ton of revenue, but it was you know, built in the late 1990s. Like, you know, we need, This is something we need to refactor and update. And as you start to do that, do you want to just like have your one team do that all by itself in isolation, recreating the wheel? No, what you want is you want them to all be on a similar platform and then you know, using what they need. And the difference between um, that platform and you know, using something like Amazon Web Services is that you can set that platform up to be uh, specific to your own business needs. Right? If you look at the AWS um, services as a platform layer, the one thing you will notice is that it's all relatively generic. Right? I mean, you know, all the components are designed for as many different businesses as possible. Even voice recognition is a relatively generic service, right? But you and your business, you might have some very specific needs, right? I don't know, maybe you need to do machine learning training sets on, you know, the how fast goldfish eat their food, you know, or whatever it is. I know, that was, that was, a, ter that was, that was a terrible analogy. That was, that was a good one, right? Yeah, Metaphor. Like, wait, I don't get it. <laughs> That's OK. That means I'm obtuse. Uh, I think, uh, actually, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, back to 
uh, functional service monitoring. So uh, given lifespan of function call half a second or so. I mean, even with container, you could have your host container that does permit you some other stuff that gives you ability to measure. If your pipeline has 10,000 calls and you know they have to be ordered, suddenly stuff doesn't work even on AWS, we see really bad performance. How do you properly monitor the stuff? How do you have telemetry that's cheaper than actually function? You do, you monitor with it. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any easy answers for you, right? I remember the very first SDN company I saw, a competitor, I'm not going to talk about who it is. Um, but, you know, they came in, and I'm an old network guy, and I looked at what they did, and I said, you know, the very first problem I've got is I need to see what's going on. I need tools. I need a whole set of tools. I'm not going to be able to use HP OpenView or whatever. Like, I, like, the fact that it's all distributed and you've got these extra abstraction layers in there is, is, a, is a problem. And I'd say that's currently still a problem. And what you do is you see people trying to solve it in a variety of ways. And the CNCF and the Kubernetes ecosystem is using Prometheus and open tracing and things like that. Um, but the reality of the situation is it's still early. And I'd say, actually, that is an area of huge opportunity. If you want to go do a startup doing one that's focused on monitoring and telemetry and operational tools uh, and making it possible to sort of manage large distributed applications, that's, that's a good way to make a lot of money. Do you think it will push people to rewrite or architect their application in a way if one function call doesn't succeed, we just move on? Yeah, I mean, that's something like how circuit breaking works today, right? Well, and, and, and function as a service is effectively built around that same model, right? You have, you have a, a, a proxy that wants to call out those functions for you. If a function fails, you try it again. Right, the end user doesn't necessarily even have to know that something failed in the, in the process. Yeah, a key, a key there that I always like to talk about is in the past, the whole Pez versus Cal thing, what we do is we try to pretend that we could take two servers and make sure that they had 100% uptime. And then when we suddenly had like a major outage, like it was like, oh, how'd that happen? Let's keep it from ever happening again. Whereas when we look at the web scale guys and kind of the aha, aha moments around cloud native, a lot of them are related to failures will happen so instead of preventing them from ever happening, we'll just try to make sure that they happen in such a way that we can route around them or that we only get a certain percentage of failures and we still at least have some kind of partial service. So it's much more of a model that accepts that failure occurs and just says, what do we do when failure occurs? Uh, running heartbeat of millisecond will cost you, right? Yeah, that's right, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, when you do it 10, times 10,000. <laughs> Right? I mean, even look at some of the outages that uh, Amazon had with S3 related to the gossip protocol. Okay, since oh, you, uh, you work at a hardware box maker now, I'm going to stir the pot a little more. So when you look at yeah, the... Yeah, three the, years in a row now. <laughs> <laughs> different, two different ones. Yeah, right, three, three hops. So uh, when you look at the purchasing of boxes, you, you see that there's a greater and greater concentration of buyers from, for boxes, right? Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook. Oh, yeah. You know, they're buying the majority, and I think it's the majority now of servers from Intel, same thing for network. And they're doing their own hardware now, right? They have enough revenue, they have enough cash flow, they can do their own hardware. Oh, yeah, when, um, when I was at cloud scaling, Seagate was an investor, and they came in, they said, yeah, just last year, I forget what year this was, 2011, 2012, they said just that past year, basically the public cloud guys had started buying more disk drives from them than all the other in systems integration people who put it at a chassis. Right, and so yeah. you know, I know Amazon did a lot of SDN. I don't know what they're doing. Silicon, maybe the FPGAs, but they were doing. You know, they're they're doing. They started it years ago, and they're doing it now. So, what does that mean for the Cisco's and the Junipers of the world? If you're the Amazon's and the Googles and the Microsofts, they see the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And those who run globally distributed data centers, they're deep in the muck, and they know what they need and they're doing it in many cases. What does that mean for uh, Cisco's and Junipers, and ultimately Intel, I think, but I think it's gonna hit network first. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the general sense of things, I think that you know, everybody's asking for disaggregated systems and they're asking for ways to kind of assemble things themselves. Um, I've seen a lot of people fail that way. I brought in o ODMs to Korea Telecom, to AT&T, to Walmart, and, and in most cases that wound up not working well because if you're gonna consume sort of white box hardware at scale, you actually have to have hardware engineering and integration testing machines at scale, and most people don't. So they think it's a great idea until they start to find out that one white box is not the same as, as the, another white box, even if it came in the same batch from the same vendor with the same components you ordered. There's variation in the supply chain. And so people like Apple, Google, 
you know, Amazon, they're managing that supply chain tightly. And unless you're willing to do the same, I don't think that it's very, you can be very successful. So I think there's always a place for the, for the hardware vendors. The challenge is, is that more and more, at the low end at least, you know, people have the choice to, to get sort of the good enough white box and they can manage it at scale. So top of rack, you know, that's done. But in Juniper's case, you know, our number one largest growing segment is actually the public cloud providers, right? It's all the high end stuff. You know, they're just not going to go out and build, you know, those kinds of that, those kinds of ASICs. They're focused on ASICs that you know are generating revenue for them, and we've got a great box that kicks ass at the high end. Now, will that always be the case? I don't know. At some point, maybe you know we can't stay ahead of the curve. Um, but at least right now, for that for that use case at the high end, you know, it still makes sense. There's still a lot of places where people are putting in, you know, an SRX or a PA networks firewall, you know, especially at the edge where they want to just have like a central siphoning point. Is that what I would recommend for everything? No, I'm the cloud native software guy, right? But I there's there's still a place for hardware. It's just definitely at the low end where the where that's uh, the commoditization's happened. Randy, just adding on to your comment, I think one of the keys for those guys doing it, it has to be a high volume app. They're not going to do it for 200 routers in their global network. They'll do it where they can replicate processor chips and gossip is Amazon's doing an ARM chip of their own for servers. Um, but they're, I don't think they're, I don't think you're going to see it for the high end boxes unless there's a ton of units just as an economical point. I think that's probably true. I'll go in a different direction for developers. So um, in a multi-cloud world, if you're working in an IT department and you see massive amount of boxes on a SAP slide and all of the public clouds, and you see the massive eye chart that is the CNCF landscape slide, um, how do you decide when you're you're putting together effectively your custom platform as a service, how do you decide which things you bring yourself and operate yourself versus just go SAP and just have somebody else do it for you? Because obviously it's more effort to do it yourself, but you get well, some portability out of it. Services as a platform is something that's not really tied to private or public. Right, you might you know uh, start thinking about services a platform as being something that's more an abstract concept. Like yeah. here, I've just kind of called it out as being this kind of middle layer. Um, but you know, it's more a mentality and an architectural model and an operational model than anything else, right? So you might start thinking about SaaS, services a platform as a way to have the discussion inside your business about how you're going to enable developers. And then that might be composed of both services that you consume in the public cloud and the private cloud that you're building. And you might go through a triage process of saying, OK, this is something that we can deploy, DNS, something else like that that's just non-differentiating. And we'll just get that up and running using Kubernetes and Helm chart um, or whatever the, the, the mechanism is. And then this other thing, this is something that's foundational to our business we're actually going to need to build this ourselves. It's some of our secret sauce, and we're going to deliver that as an internal service and possibly even a public service that we run both in public and private. Right. I mean, so there's businesses that have the SAP as a culture, right, like Bezos. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's right. And, but, I mean, like, you have a choice of running MySQL yourself versus consuming a MySQL API or another database API that'll effectively do the same thing for you. Um, and you have that choice again and again and again um, when you're you know, a developer consuming services left and right. Yeah, you want it's, that choice. It's, you know, it's, it's really easy candy to go and grab all of these AWS like services. like on a public cloud. Uh, versus a little bit of hard work, right, to run it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so how do people make that decision? I mean, what's the, what's uh, the advice? Well, if you're a retailer, <laughs> you don't go to Amazon, I'll tell you that. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of businesses that have decided that, um, you know, it's important for them to operate inside their business for certain kinds of applications. Like, they just, they don't want to put it outside. So I think that's pre a pretty classic answer, which is like, this is this something that I have to apply particular security, governance, 
hardware components to high frequency trading, whatever, and that stays inside the business. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd say that if I'm honest, the, the, the number of enterprises that are gonna go invest into that, it seems pretty small compared to the number of enterprises that there are. And if we look at the ones like in OpenStack land, like AT&T and Walmart that have done pretty large investments in OpenStack and have started backing into building ecosystems like this, um, you know, these are serious investments. And then- How about like, you, you were also saying like time to business, right? I mean- uh, Business time to value. Yeah, business time to value, right? Yeah. So we all love to hate hardware, um, but we are introducing an extraordinary uh, amount of hardware onto our internet. Everything from drones to cars to toasters. Uh, let's say I had a bunch of drones. Do you see them simply as a small box where everything's handled through SAP? Or do you see people running local Kubernetes clusters? Uh, on the drone? On the drone. Or on a, you know. I mean, this is one of the areas that started to get interesting, which is uh, edge computing. And I think, you know, we always see these pendulum swings in technology, right? Centralized, decentralized, whatever. I mean, it goes different ways. Um, sometimes the pendulum sticks a certain way just because it starts to make a lot of sense and we don't really go back. Um, but generally, there's sort of a swing. And I think one thing we're starting to see, and you see some serious investments from like Amazon and Google and Microsoft capitalize on it, is just a recognition that there's a whole set of uh, use cases that uh, uh, get a lot of value from very low latency interactions where you actually want to push the comp computation closer to the edge of the network. Uh, where the actual data is so they can respond in real time to whatever's going on there. So I think it's less likely that we'll run a Kubernetes cluster on the drone. It's more likely that we're running Kubernetes clusters or at least function as a service close to the edge of the network and then allow the drone to talk to that. So I have a question here in the back. Um, so you, you were commenting earlier, I'm just sort of picking up on few pieces you just mentioned. One was, OpenStack is not dead. It has enough legs to carry forward. Uh, the second piece is around enterprises, uh, you know, what they're willing to invest and build on their own and which enterprises. So my observation was some of the reasons why maybe OpenStack did not pick up was the enterprise adoption didn't really happen at the scale and speed maybe it needed to. So the question is, with the what are some of the newer innovations which might help sort of the mid to large enterprises maybe either move away from VMware and kind of build some of their own services as a platform or you know how are they going to kind of proceed and what would their what would your advice be yeah so um i don't really want to spend a lot of time on openstack success and failure in this venue for obvious reasons um, but let me just say that I would say a lot of that is self-inflicted wounds, um, both from the enterprise and from the OpenStack community itself. I think a lot of things could have been avoided um, in terms of getting to where it is and in terms of um, having greater adoption earlier. I think you know, there, there, were, there, were, there were ways to avoid some of the things that happened um, and to accelerate adoption. But that being said, part of this presentation is the path, if, if you have decided you're going to invest in a private cloud, I'm trying to tell you that this shit doesn't really matter. Well, it's PG in here. <laughs> I didn't go to R. We're gonna have a great, great New Year's party with all the money that Randy's donated. Okay, when, <laughs> when I get excited and passionate and start like slamming on the screen, don't stop I'm me. I'll like give you the I'll, I'll give you the dollar later. Okay. This stuff, <laughs> this stuff, just say S-H-I-T in your head whenever I say stuff so you'll get the impact. <laughs> this stuff doesn't really matter, but yet a lot of people spend a lot of time navel gazing and worrying about that stuff, even though you know it's basically very low value. This stuff matters a lot and is very high value. So even if you were inside the business and you were like, oh, let's just run Kubernetes on bare metal and simplify the networking stack and simplify the storage stack and just make it like very unified and all developers get to do is basically deploy services on it, I think you would do great. 
But the point is, is that if the enterprise doesn't have this mentality that they're going to build a suite of services that can then be used you know, as sort of an a la carte menu for applications to build their own cu custom pass on a per application basis, if they don't come with that mentality, then I think adopting DevOps and building their own private cloud inside the business doesn't work. Because what's going on in the public cloud is clearly this. I mean, you can argue with me about the term, you can argue with me about all kinds of stuff, but you just have to look at this chart and see that this is what is causing Amazon to win. It's creating stickiness and it's driving just more and more use cases and opening up more and more markets for them. The first time I've heard S3 described as low value. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe they should charge more for it. <laughs> uh, multi access, access. Uh, MEC related question. So we see on one side some telcos adopting, Telefonic is adopting, Greengrass, some other stuff. Uh, on the other side in the US they say, oh, we'll do at CMEC and provide all the APIs ourselves. No OTT will ever come to our platform. Where do you see stuff going? I, I didn't quite get all of that, but I, I think you were saying that you know AWS Greengrass is like a platform and then somebody else is competing with them, has their own APIs? Yeah. Especially in US, you see telcos themselves saying, we are going telcos. to develop this and keep OTTs away. Well, this is an ecosystem that's working and growing very rapidly every day. And you can either pretend that this can be competed with, or you can get on the bandwagon and you can, you can roll with the growth, right? I mean, I could show you the hockey stick growth slide again at the beginning. But in my opinion, you know, telcos would, um, I hope I didn't get in trouble for this, but they would be in better shape trying to work with the public cloud and, and ride you know, that sort of asymptotic growth rather than try to pretend they're going to build sort of a counterweight to it. I mean, that ship has sailed. They didn't see it. Uh, may I ask one more question? Since somewhere asked you about Juniper, I have another question. Uh, Open Contrail going to Linux Foundation. What do you expect in return? What do I expect in return? So the motivation um, between the uh, for the community reboot and for moving to foundation was a few things. So first of all, there were a lot of member, a lot of customers and members of the community that really wanted to see, you know, uh, more people than Juniper sort of, you know, being part of the governance model, both the business and technical, and that was very important to them. And and they felt that, you know, that was a key sign of a healthy open source community. And I and I agree with that. Um, and then uh, the second part is that, you know, Open Control has been very successful, probably the most successful SDN product out there in terms of the size of the deployments and scale. Um, but if we're honest, you know, it really has the most foothold um, with, with service providers and carriers. It has some in, with the enterprise, but it has zero with developers and zero with public cloud. And so what we'd like to see is we'd like to see Open Control being a much more widely adopted you know, networking stack. I mean, people are doing things like using Calico right now uh, for the Kubernetes clusters, and I get it, right? It's a developer who's like, I just need basic networking, except at some point, you need more than basic networking. And so I'd like to see an outcome where open control is more of a default that people put in Kubernetes and they get as, as little as they need and are successful with it, you know, in a very simple way at the outset. But then as they grow up and they find out that they need higher order networking services and capabilities and security and sort of like, you know, federated, you know, security models with intent driven policies that, you know, cross clouds that there's something that steps up and goes with them. And I think that that's a contrail. So it's sort of like one of those things of like, you can keep it to yourself and then maybe you're a big fish in a small pond or you can let it go and you can be a small fish in a much bigger pond and, and we, we're choosing that second route. So you think it will increase your chances to get adoption in open source community? Would it be right? I don't know, but we're going to go for it's it. It's not cheap, you know. In case of Open Delight, it's just well through distribution. You have to fit whole layer of people in Linux Foundation. In your case, it goes off your top line. You need to, to justify this. Uh, you know, if you'd like to sit down with Rami, you could always try to schedule an appointment with him and, and, and ask him about what he's thinking. You know, I've kind of told you sort of our strategy. I, I do believe, or my strategy, I do believe that there is an opportunity for us to be the world's, you know, most enterprise grade, you know, software defined networking stack. I mean, right now today, if you went out and you said, what is a really kick-ass software defined networking stack? And then what's an open source 
kick ass. You know, you, you know, it's a it's a it's a game of one right now, right? I mean, you get what you paid for. Okay. Um, are, how are you guys doing? Are you are you about to drop dead? You have a few more minutes. I think we have a couple more questions. If you're willing to take them. I'm good. Okay. Uh, Go for it. Yeah. Uh, what do you think Nginx as a sidecar in Istio? Say again. Uh, what do you think about using Nginx as a sidecar in Istio? Nginx as a sidecar to Istio? Yeah. I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Well, I have one, but go ahead, Robert. <laughs> I'm not informed enough. <laughs> Versus yeah. NYA, I mean, no, I, I, I think that uh, look, Envoy is a new technology, and so a lot of people are looking at it because it provides some very interesting capabilities. But for some of the services that people are looking for, Istio provides a very nice service mesh engine. And Nginx can provide a, a, an interesting sidecar to provide that load balancing and uh, SSL termination function in some environments, right? So it, it can be a useful tool. It really depends on your actual use cases, though. OK, thanks. Yeah. And I agree with Randy. I love that Lyft donated that. Envoy, uh, did you go to that, those sessions at KubeCon? They no. were packed. I mean, all those things, Istio, Service Mesh, and the Lyft donating Envoy, just really cool stuff. So if you guys are working on projects like that that are useful to other people, put them out there in the community. Really, really love that. Well, I'll say what I said before, which is that sometimes people get confused, especially in the early days of cloud computing. They said, what's this cloud computing stuff? Like, every, like we've been doing this for a long time. Like, this is just all the same stuff. And it's, and it's yes, there isn't, all, there isn't necessarily new stuff that comes out in computer science, but what happens is that we reconfigure and we decide that we're willing to take different trade-offs. Like rather than pretending that you know, an HA pair can be up all the time, we say we'd rather have 10 you know, systems in an array, and if one of them goes down, we lose 10% of our capacity, and oh well, we're okay with operating at 90% capacity. Like That's not like some brand new way of thinking about the world, it's just a decision to make a different set of trade-offs. So something like Envoy is very similar. It says, hey, there's a way to take a different approach to having this service mesh that sort of is for a distributed, you know, web-based, you know, web micro set of microservices. Um, and you know, we'll just take 10, you know, percent of each of these different functionalities and weave it in so you don't have to cobble it together yourself. And that's a very different way of thinking about it. You have less choice. You want a different kind of load balancer between your microservices in Kubernetes and you deploy an Envoy? That's not very easy. Right? But on the other hand, you have to do less heavy lifting. That's why Kubernetes is so popular, right? How, how do the uh, services that um, how do the services that uh, Amazon uh, provides compare to those services which you can get on uh, open source or purchase? How do the services that Amazon gives you? I mean, I think one of the biggest things is they're taking care of the labor for you. And the operational labor, and that's that's a really big deal. So how about open source? You're talking about sort of feature to feature kind of comparisons. Yeah, I mean it, it it varies, right? Somebody like you know Netflix is using Cassandra very successfully rather than DynamoDB, and I don't think they would ever go back. Um, you know, you are sometimes very limited when you go and you use some of these systems that are on the public clouds because they're building towards the lowest common denominator. Whereas if you do need, you know, some like very advanced uh, database features of some kind, it might be easier to implement open source. But on the other hand, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but there's a lot of open source that is stuff. So um, <laughs> that open source. No, we'll that take is we'll take the money, Randy. We'll take is, the money. Um, is uh, you know it's not really you know on par with the public services. So I think it's case by case. Can you comment on the uh, FPGA based computing in the public cloud? For example, you know, AWS now offers EC2 F1 instances which have you know, FPGAs. So what do you think about its role? I mean, you know, one of the things that's really interesting right now is sort of this revolution around machine learning. And I, I've got a buddy who was doing AI in the early days at Psych, and you know, I was sitting there with him, and he was so jaded. He's like, "Oh, this AI comes and goes in these waves," and I'm like, ah, "There's a difference this time. And the difference is that people have realized that they're not going to use AI to be this general. Like, it's not going to be Skynet." Like you go in and there's a domain specific problem you're trying to solve, image recognition, cloud operations, you know, cloud security, whatever it is, and you're, you're solving that domain specific problem. 
as you do that, you may find out that you're going to top out on you know single threaded, single core type capabilities, and and that may matter in case where you need you know like uh, real throughput or you've got sort of a uh, a set where the inference engine is gonna is just gonna take too long to do the data processing you need. In that case, you know TensorFlow, you know TPUs, FPGAs, all those kinds of things give you an opportunity to actually do something very, um, to, you know, to even more domain specific. You're just narrowing it down. So, and that way, I see this direct relationship between machine learning and the advent of a lot of this kind of, you know, programmable hardware in the cloud. But I'm, people may find even more interesting ways to use those FPGAs. I, I think it'd be great. I mean, you could almost imagine somebody, you know, building a layer seven DPI, you know, in FPGAs that they could program and reprogram in a scale out manner across the cloud. That'd be pretty badass. I, I love yes, that no. Randy starts statements with, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, because you start a lot of statements that way. And do you ever actually get in trouble? And oh, yeah. What does that look like? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard him say that a lot. Um, do we have any more questions? Or any more questions? OK, one more. Oh, not you. Anybody but you. <laughs> one more. <laughs> I love this so much. You guys indulged me. I love this so much. And you indulged me. Thank you so much for this. This oh, is the most questions I've ever answered. In we a told session. you we bring it. This group is serious. Uh, Linkert uh, service mesh integration for Kubernetes. The claim it's working, it's easy, it's Linkerd. deployable. What do you think? I, I don't have a big opinion on Linkerd. I haven't spent a lot of time with it, although I get the impression that they've decided that it's heavyweight and they're working on a replacement called Conduit or something like that. Is that right? It's already happened. It's, yeah. it's, I went Conduit to the LinkedIn meetup, but you did too. You were yeah, there. Yeah, Conduit with Envoy, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I We mean, geeked I, out last week in Austin. Oh, dead. I, I did not say it was dead. No, no, Robert no, no, did. No, no it's, not, it's not dead. Look, Linkerd was providing the, the mesh function of the service mesh, right? There still needs to be something that's providing the proxy. Right, because effectively in the service mesh, what you're doing is you're saying all traffic has to flow through some central point. Yes, distributed, but still it's a centralized point because it's providing discovery, it's providing security, it's providing all these different resources. And I think what the Linkerd community or the, the, the developers there said was, well, you know, we're looking more at the, the mesh part, the how do these things interact, the, the discovery resources, et cetera, not so much the proxy part. So why don't we use Envoy, which the community seems to now say, hey, this is probably the proxy to use. Right? Again, not to say that Nginx is bad, just that you know, there, there's, there's always shifts. Um, so why don't we use that within the Linkerd space? I, I mean, the thing that I think is amazing about that is that there have been some other communities where it wasn't possible to have sort of competitive projects. You know, you would try to bring up something that would maybe be a possible replacement for an existing open source project, and that would be, get quashed. I'm not going to say which communities. Um, and I like seeing that in the CNCF, there's a little bit more of a different attitude, which is that you know the the cream rises to the top, and we'll pick the best stuff and use that. Because I, I think the outcome for open source is great when you have that sort of market dynamic, even though open source isn't a money making enterprise in itself. And I think open source hurts itself the most when it tries to be closed about the way that um, the projects evolve. Right? It tries to force certain projects to succeed. Um, when maybe they should just be taken out back and shot. Wow. And I think I heard somewhere that you might actually have the guns to do it. I do have guns. I don't mean like, I mean like. Nobody asked me any personal questions. I know, people, right? Why was I the only one? Oh, no, 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 what? no, no. Because I, <laughs> we're not going down that line. Rocky, one last, can you indulge Rocky for the last question? Because, you know, she's got a distro named after a whole, a whole release. So where's the slide of your daughter? Right? Yeah. I, I, should, I, should, put, I should put one on here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, had, I had one in uh, Seattle. I think it was uh, one of the Kubicons or something like that. Uh, Open Sec Day Seattle. Open Sec Day Seattle. Was that yeah. it? Yeah. You're and uh, I had this picture of, um, uh, what's the monster from Monsters, Inc., the big one? Oh, Mike? For the big one. Sully. 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 So there's a picture of Sully holding Boo's hand like this, and Boo's got the hair like this. And my daughter is was one year old at the time, and her pigtails came out exactly like that. So the next slide was me holding her hand, <laughs> and she looks just like her with the big cheeks and everything. So that, was, that was pretty cool, actually. It was really cute. I feel like it, I, this one doesn't work. I love the way you started your keynote too in SDXE. Randy, Randy gets on stage and he goes. 
By the way, I didn't lose my luggage in, um, because my luggage didn't get lost in, in on my flight. I, I This is how I dress. I'm not an executive, you know, I didn't lose the blazer. And I know I love it. I love it. He's a community guy and he's one of us. And it's <laughs> it's been so much fun. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank and, you. And um, really appreciate it. We're going to have to get him back here and talk about, you know, Cotta containers and all the other things that we get, we're going to talk about in the next couple of uh, months. Sounds good. Yeah, I almost asked a question on that, but I didn't know who wanted to take it. So um, you're going to have to ask them personally. But we're going to have a whole meetup and a hands on lab on it probably in January, maybe February. So seriously, thank you so much for your time, yeah, Randy you. and Robert and everybody that came. Give it up for Randy and Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you guys in January. Happy New Year.